Many people in Northern Ireland live with a sensory disability. Some people are blind or have sight loss. Some are deaf or have hearing loss. Some people may be deaf blind and have a sight and hearing loss. Some people can be registered as blind and for them the main difficulties would be mobilising safely, communication and maintaining daily tasks. However, most people will retain some level of useful vision. The main causes of sight loss are age-related macular degeneration. This is a loss of central vision, which makes it hard for a person to see things directly in front of them and causes difficulty with driving, reading and recognising faces. People with this condition may retain good peripheral or side vision. Glaucoma. This is caused by increased pressure in the eye, which causes damage to the optic nerve. This results in tunnel vision, which makes it difficult to use stairs or steps safely due to poor depth perception. Diabetic retinopathy. This is caused by diabetes and results in patchy vision. This can make it difficult to see oncoming traffic or pedestrians. It can also be difficult to see at night or in poorly lit places. Cataracts. This occurs when the lens of the eye becomes cloudy. It leads to blurred vision and sensitivity to glare or bright lights. This can often be resolved by surgery. Age is the biggest single cause of hearing loss. Most people begin to lose a small amount of their hearing from around 40 years of age. This hearing loss increases as you get older. By the age of 80, most people may have significant hearing problems. It's kind of the start. The weekend is always busy. That's why I got our tickets in advance. High frequency sounds, such as female or children's voices, may become difficult to hear. It may also be harder to hear consonants such as S, F and the. This can make understanding speech, especially where there is background noise, very difficult. Noise-induced hearing loss. Another common cause of hearing loss is damage to the ear from repeated exposure to loud noises over time, such as pneumatic drills or compressed air hammers, working in environments where there's loud music, such as nightclubs, or often listening to music at a high volume through headphones. Hearing loss can also occur suddenly after exposure to an exceptionally loud noise, such as an explosion, which perforates the eardrum. People with medical conditions such as meningitis, diabetes, chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease are also at increased risk of hearing loss, including deafness. People can also be born deaf or become totally deaf and this could cause communication difficulties. People may use sign language to communicate. The two main sign languages used in Northern Ireland are British Sign Language and Irish Sign Language. Both are unique languages in their own right and it cannot be assumed that a person using British or Irish Sign Language can communicate in both. People who are deaf-blind may require specialist sign language, such as deaf-blind manual or block alphabet to aid communication. Tinnitus. This is a noise that is generated in the brain and it does not have any external source. It is often described as ringing in the ears. The sound heard is unique to the individual, such as hissing, buzzing, grinding or whistling noises. For some people, this may come and go and cause them little difficulties. For others, it can be continuous and have a major impact on their everyday life. In severe cases, this can be very distressing for the person and can lead to poor concentration and difficulty sleeping and this in turn can lead to depression. Let's listen to what some people with hearing or sight loss have to say. When I was born, I was a preemie, premature. My retina hadn't fully developed in the, in the uh, right eye, so basically I was, <clears throat> I was uh, blind in one eye my whole life and never actually realized that I was any different from anybody else. Uh, as of about five years ago, 
I noticed my eyesight getting much worse. Then I find out that I had cataracts in my left eye and my eyesight was slowly going downhill. And at that point I was a sales rep, which my job in, involved a lot, of, a lot of driving. And at that point I realized I, my livelihood was slipping away. So I decided to pack things up in the United States and come back home. It made an awful difference to my life. It made my life harder because, I mean, you couldn't communicate with people. And in my job, and um, where I was using a telephone and that, I couldn't hear on the telephone. I couldn't hear the other girls in the office. So it made life very difficult. I'm with children as well. When I first lost my sight, it was a, as a result of a car accident. And I was age 16. And it's quite a traumatic time being 16 when you have to think about your career choices and exams and things like that. And then to find that you've lost your sight and not being able to be independent, being able to read, go out on your own. Uh, it was quite devastating, especially at that age. Well, I was diagnosed with my sight loss about two years ago and um, I felt as if my life was over, basically, because um, I thought I was going to be confined to this house and never be able to do anything. Because when you're told that, it's just such a big thing to say to anybody, you know, you're losing your sight or you're going to lose your sight. So it's a very lonely place because people around you, um, they don't really understand. People with sight don't really, I think, understand, you know, to go from full sight to no sight or partial sight is a very difficult um, transition. Very, very, it makes you very lonely, very depressed, scared. It, it's something that I gradually came to be aware of. Uh, although from a very young age I began to realise I was different in some way from the other children and the way that came across to me was I felt like I was not as smart as anyone else. I, I used to think Oh, everyone else can speak so much better than me. Everyone understands things better than me, and uh, it, it just—I just felt I just felt inferior to all the other children, even from a very, very, very young age. I can say that. And as I got older, I just became more and more aware of it. Uh, it just—I <sighs> wasn't aware that I had a problem with my ears and hearing because. My wife was given off for uh, a number of years about the television being too loud or I was ignoring her and uh, just going up to bed and she's, people, she would say, do you need that television that loud? And I wasn't aware that it was loud at all. To me it was just natural. He actually didn't realise that he had a hearing loss but it was driving me round the bend because the TV had to be on so loud I was sitting with my fingers in my ears at night. When you said something to him, you had to repeat it about six times. And it gets to the point where you're nearly accused of shouting at each other. Um, so it was becoming a problem and then he was diagnosed with the hearing loss and needed to get the hearing aid. But he still wasn't keen on actually admitting that there was actually a problem or seeking help. Um, until he broke his ankle and because of other health problems he was really quite bed bound at that time. My mum is deaf blind now. Uh, originally she was hearing impaired with uh, normal sight but because of glaucoma uh, was well maintained over the years and with medication there was no issues until the last year and there has been a dramatic uh, loss of sight and she is now deaf blind. What help is available if you have a sensory loss? There are sensory support teams located within five health trusts in Northern Ireland. Contact details are provided at the end of this DVD. These teams provide specialist support and work to reduce the impact of sensory loss for individuals and help them to overcome any difficulties they may be experiencing in their daily lives. The teams are staffed by social workers, visual and deaf rehabilitation and support workers. The teams accept self-referrals or alternatively someone can be referred by the GP or other health professionals, a family member, friend or a carer. 
The individual will then be contacted in the most appropriate way to discuss their circumstances and prioritise the referral. How did I get referred to the sensory support team? I went to the doctors and they mentioned that I should register as being blind. So at that point, uh, I did that. I was in the process of that. Then after uh, a visit to uh, the visual, the low vision clinic, and they were the ones that put me in touch with social services. Well, I was referred to the sensory support team through the hospital I was attending, and um, I felt at first I really didn't want anybody to come out to me, to be honest. And I was sort of thinking, you sort of just don't want everybody to know your business. And I think it's the fear of that. It's the fear of people coming in and you don't want them to take control away from you or make you do things that maybe you don't want to do. So I was a wee bit dubious about being referred, but I knew in the back of my head that if I didn't take the help from them, that I was just going to be left sitting in, in this house and that was something I didn't want to do. Well, the reason I got in contact with um, the sensory support team was whenever our mother died five years ago and I took on responsibility for my brother's affairs and I considered and needed that wee bit of help to guide me as to what was the best for Donald. I first came across the sensory support team when um, they came out to visit me uh, to discuss my sight loss and um, to discuss you know, how I was dealing with mobility and everyday life. Um, my dad died and that was at the end of 10 years of basically just shutting myself away from the world um, and I, I, I just hit rock bottom at that point, I had nowhere left to go and uh, I was referred to a um, counsellor who then referred me on to the sensory support team um, because I had worries at the time I, I would rely on my dad a lot for, for you know, thing that needed good hearing, as it were, and uh, he was gone. Each person's experience of a sensory loss is individual to them. Through providing a person-centred assessment, a member of the team will meet with you in your home at a time convenient to you. You will have the opportunity to explore the impact of your sensory loss and consider options of support available to you and your family. This can be through rehabilitation, training, the provision of aids or equipment or signposting to other statutory or voluntary agencies. Social workers in the team will assess the full impact of your sensory loss on all aspects of your daily life, physically, socially, emotionally and financially. If you are experiencing other issues in addition to your sensory loss, your social worker may suggest referring you to other agencies for support. They can also provide support and information for people who may be caring for you. Rehabilitation workers provide one-to-one -one training to help you learn new skills to maintain your independence and safety. This can be through mobility training, daily living skills and communication methods. They can teach new techniques and or provide aids and equipment to maintain your independence and safety both in and outside your home. The sensory support team called. Um, we had a chat on the settee which lasted well over an hour and she asked me how my hearing loss was affecting uh, various facets of my life. Uh, she was making notes whilst I spoke and obviously this was so that she could assess what I really needed to bring life back to normal. So the team sent a few people out at first. Uh, they all came out to the house to me uh, because at the time I, I really couldn't leave the house myself. I just couldn't go outside. So they, they came to me. Uh, they sat down with me for an hour, two hours, something like that. And we just talked and talked and talked about everything that uh, had gone wrong for me and what could be done to help me. Um. I was involved very much in the uh, assessment for the direct payments with uh, the social worker 
and uh, say it worked very, very well. This young lady from social services showed up at my front door and she, it just turned my whole life around. Um, she was incredibly helpful, uh, sympathetic, uh, very patient, listened very carefully to everything I spoke about, uh, my concerns, what may happen in the future, uh, what may be available to help me. And she was very, very meticulous and just explained all my options. So when I came home, I had nothing. And I just, I couldn't cope very well at all. And I had a lot of pressure because I had a bereavement and I had a, a disabled mother and I wasn't able to lift the telephone and I had no one to help me. And it was just like, what am I gonna do? And when Sensory Support came out, they were tremendous, absolutely tremendous. It was, they didn't say to me, you have to have, you have to have. They were, would you like to try? We'll try and do this for you. And they've been absolutely tremendous. The lady came out from the sensory support team and she was very, very good. She made me feel at ease straight away. And it was the first point of contact that I got a chance to actually tell somebody how I felt. And I felt that she listened to me which was very important to me because it's very difficult to speak to your family. So it is, so I found it easy to speak to someone who understood the eye, different eye conditions. And um, she was absolutely, put me at ease, told me, assured me that there was a lot of things could be done to help me. There was a lot of aids I could get, there was a lot of help out there. And when she left, I felt a wee bit brighter that something could be done to help me. The assessment process took about two, two and a half hours. It mm -hmm. was quite, it was a much longer than what I expected. And I would have to say I came out of that assessment feeling a lot happier about what the future would hold for my mum. On completion of the assessment, the actions agreed to meet your needs are recorded in a care plan of which you are given a copy. This can be in a format suited to your needs, such as audio description or braille. Some actions may take longer to achieve than others, but your named worker will continue to support you and review your needs. You may identify new goals and these can be added to your care plan. I was involved very, very much in my care plan at every stage. I was asked um, what I needed. Never once was anything suggested to me. They said, what do you have difficulty with? And when I highlighted the areas that I had difficulty with, like lighting, they brought me out three or four different lights and I chose the one that was best for me. They put bumps on my washing machine, little raised knoblets, and that means I can feel the program as it goes round. Um, the magnifiers as well, I, I was given different types for different um, reading books, reading magazines. I was also given a little um, telescope because I told the lady that I went to the theatre and she very kindly said, well we have the very thing and give me a wee telescope and I use it in the theatre to see on the stage. Um, they offered me that I need rails anywhere. What, everything they asked me, they asked me what I needed and what was best for me. So I was very much involved in that right from the start. Um, it was actually quite a relief whenever we were referred to the team and, and at that stage we were both really quite happy um, to get the help. Um, Adrian, my husband, has a rare genetic condition um, called Axenfield Ragor syndrome and in fact our 16 year old daughter has the same syndrome. So she also wears two hearing aids. Um, so it was actually, there was a sense of relief that we were perhaps going to have some help. Um, and when the member of the team heard or got our referral, we actually were seen extremely quickly. In fact, the social worker told us that morning she would make the referral. And that afternoon we had a phone call from the sensory team who felt that this was a priority referral and was going to come out that afternoon. So it happened very quickly. And when the member of the team came out, there was a full assessment carried out in terms of my husband's needs. Um, but it wasn't just my husband's needs, it was also myself as a carer, how the situation was impacting on me and was there anything that could be done to help and support me in the situation. 
So together we sat down and looked at all of the issues that were impacting on us as a family and a care plan was agreed on and an action plan um, and promises were made that particular things be put in place and equipment provided and um, for example we got equipment that enables my husband to hear the doorbell when it rings or when the phone rings um, and the telephone and fire alarm so for me as a carer who works full time um, it was a relief to know that I could go out to work and know that if the fire alarm went off or if the doorbell rang or whatever that Adrian would actually hear it um, and we can also sit and watch the TV together at night now and not get into our eye over how loud the TV is on. So that is actually quite pleasant that I don't have to sit and watch the TV with fingers in both ears. How has the sensory support team helped me? When I got support then from the sensory support team, it meant that I was able to do small chores at home, even making a cup of tea, uh, because obviously you're frightened with using boiling water, um, just making your own breakfast. And that could build up then for being able to have the confidence to be able to go out on your own, even if that was just with someone that was you were taking their arm. And that would be built up to using a cane and being able to feel a bit more independence, but it was a gradual process. They, they pointed me toward different organisations that could potentially help me. Uh, they stored a lot of equipment for me, things that I would never have even known existed at the time. Uh, one of the things they did for me that was a big help was I've always been worried about smoke alarms. Uh, as someone who can't hear too well, smoke alarms, just, I just cannot hear them. So I've always spent most of my life worried that if I'm lying in bed at night, I'm not going to hear a smoke alarm. So what they did for me was they've got me wireless smoke alarms that uh, link up to a buzzer that goes under my pillow and that will wake me up. And that has been something that, although I think most people wouldn't even think about it, it's, it's a big um, weight off my mind in many ways. Because I know now that if the alarm goes off, I don't have to rely on anybody else to, uh, you know, waken me up. I can get that done myself. Direct payments help me with Donald being able to live in his own home all the time. He has the confidence then to just to stay in the house and be happy there, say, when he returns from work. It'll, somebody can come into the house and provide him with a hot meal, tidy up or do whatever else that needs to be done for Donald and it works out very, very well. Uh, I was invited into a group of other blind people. It was a very social, very relaxed situation. Uh, the people there were ex very, very caring. It gave me the opportunity to relate to other people and actually learn a lot and actually learn a lot of tricks in order to deal with the, my eyesight situation. So again, that was a, a very positive, absolutely wonderful experience. And again, that added to uh, my lifestyle, the improvements, what a difference it made. It was just absolutely amazing. When the actions we have agreed with you have been completed, we may then close our involvement with you. We will agree this with you and give you our contact details should you require support in the future. If you agree, we will send you information from time to time which may include newsletters and articles of interest to you. Full contact details for the five sensory support teams are available on screen or on your local health and social care trust website. Contact telephone numbers for the sensory support team in your area are Belfast Trust 02895 040200 Northern Trust 
including Ballyclare, Brasheen, Maharafelt and Coleraine. 0845 600 3111. Southeastern Trust teams, including Downpatrick, Lisburn and Newtonards. 028 92 60 77 46. Southern Trust teams, including Armagh and Portadown. 028 38 39 40 88. Western Trust teams, Enniskillen. 02866 32 44 double zero. Derry Londonderry 02871 32 01 67. This DVD has been produced by the Belfast Trust Sensory Support Team. We would like to thank the Health and Social Care Board for its support. We would like to thank all the service users who contributed to this DVD.